and away you go Alistair. Right, thank you very much. Welcome everybody, we're delighted to have you with us on this our 15th of the Future Teacher webinars looking at designing for technology enhanced programs. Now on the next page um, you'll see that we've put together this food metaphor because when we were thinking about well what is a technology enhanced program and how does that vary from um, you know just using e-learning, using technology and blended learning and so on and it seemed to us the best way of thinking about it was that when you're creating a program you're creating something which is more scalable so that has to be more scalable and it's, it is in the end we felt it's the difference between just throwing together something for a tv meal which is kind of the equivalent of i'm using i'm doing my course and i'm involving a little bit of using kahoot with my students or something but that's not really a program that's like a tv meal um, but cooking a christmas lunch for 15 people then requires very different kinds of skills compared to the TV meal much more planning supplying a thousand ready meals for a street food stall you're on another level again so what we wanted to do was to look at that that scalability of the bigger things the ingredients will be identical in every case but it's the context the processes and the planning and we'll look at those by way of introduction if you haven't come across this before um, this is part of the future teacher project so do have a look at other sources and other resources that we'll point you to later and this session um, you know we're aware that you are potentially a highly mixed audience that we've got lots of people that we've seen loads of times and we love who are very familiar with this if you're getting lost at any time pop a note in the text chat pane and we'll try to um, accommodate you okay for the next page though um, this is who we are we've got Lillian myself Alistair and Ron and um, you can find out more about the project you will have this resource link in a few minutes time so if you're interested in looking at those details you can so here we are what we'd like you to do now is to go to this link learningapps.co.uk slash TEP design and we may even Ron's already pop pop that link into the text chat pane now what this means is that as soon as you're on that link you're gonna have two um, different windows to handle and apologies for that because it can be a little bit disorienting but everything else is um, embedded in that window that we just sent you the link for so it will be a lot less stressful than if we gave you a different link for different things at different times so when you've got that open kind of keep it in the background because what we're going to do now you can follow us on the main zoom screen and then when we get to activities we'll be popping you over onto the um, the resource we've just given you the link for we had a lot of um, suggestions really broad and diverse suggestions about what people would like to find out from today and again you can see these these are on that resource and so it's worth having a look through those at your leisure at some point because there may be things that you would be interested in had you thought about them and so that's worth you having a look at what other people are putting but what we want to start with here is your context your project because so much of this is about the context so if you are currently making courses or if you're embarked on a particular project or you're thinking about doing some technology enhanced learning we'd like to hear about your project so um, on your own version so the, the link we've just given you make sure you're on page six of that and you will be able to adjust the slider bars don't try adjusting them on Ron's screen because that won't work I can tell you but go to your version and tell us a little bit about either your project if it's a current project or if it's a project you'd like to do or if it's a project that you think it would be feasible within your teaching and learning context and we know we've got everybody here from you know university courses departments etc through to you know, adult community learning um, setups with you know three people and a, a laptop between them so um, if you can do that we'll give you a minute or so just to give us that and then Ron if you can take me to the next page and we'll see what sort of results we're getting <coughs> okay so keep them coming in and as they come in we'll be able to see these developing
Okay, so not surprisingly, the bits that are low are budgets and resources. The length of the course, quite a lot of variation, we've got some quite long courses there, and quite a few where people are aiming for kind of fully online. And again, we'll be covering things that will be really helpful for that. The amount of support available, very much three modes there, that's interesting. Um, and if you've got very little support you know, available for, for your development, that will obviously influence the things you can do. But be encouraged because we've got an example of uh, an AS environmental science course that was done with very, very minimum support and tools. And you can see how that's developed. So keep those coming in because, again, you can go back to that at any point and have a look at that and see where your course profile is in the relation to others around you. Um, we have got an overview mind map for you. So if you have a look at the next <coughs> slide. Now, again, on Ron's screen, um, you know, this is kind of zoomed out a bit. But if you can zoom into this, there's a plus button in the top left. And you'll notice that there's little um, notes next to uh, things. There's links. If it's an arrow, it's a link that will take you to something. If it's not an arrow, um, then it it'll have some notes that we put there so there's a wealth of information in there again it's not for us to go through now it's for you to go through with your colleagues or go through at your own leisure and um, we'll be developing some of those themes in this session the ones we don't develop come back to and see yourself what i want to do now though is to get you thinking about the things that at a very individual level the things that are important to consider. So again, if you go on to your version of this, uh, it could be handy for you to have a little play. It's page 10 of the learning resource that we're looking at. And what we've put together is, um, you know, we've looked, I've got a sort of sequence here almost of starting with the green things and then the blue things. We're looking at the students, we're looking at people, first of all. And then from the people, we look at the tools, what's, what's available, what's the infrastructure in which it's working, and then the topics, because the different topics have different pros and cons, the nature of the course, its length, for example, and fundamentally, this is a really important one, the learning intention. Is this pure instruction? Julian will talk about this later. Or is it associative constructive learning? And then what support's available to students and even what kind of target devices? Is this for mobile only consumption or part of a course that people will sit in a computer lab and, and work through? So we've got different ingredients in the jars. And again, come back to those and look at them at your own leisure. And then this is a really important bit. Um, and so we're not going to... Uh, you know, we're not going to sort of sit and spend the three minutes it takes to go through the, oh no, is it five minutes? Five minutes it takes to go through the audio here, but there's audio, there's transcript with it. But basically, we define three types of accessibility to be aware of. Technical, and you can see there, that's about the kind of WCAG standards. If that means anything to you, if it doesn't, then and pass it on to somebody else that it might do. Pedagogical accessibility, that middle one, is a really important one where you've got tremendous opportunities of, as a teacher um, to think about how your course can be more inclusive. Um, and that informational one, that's really missing in so many courses. It's that last bit about the informational accessibility is about how do the students take advantage of the accessibility features you've built in. If they don't know they can change colors, how is that benefiting them? If they don't know that the way you've done this operates with text-to-speech. So you can listen to that, or if you prefer reading, the transcript is there for each of those sections, and you can look through those. But, but don't run away designing courses without massively having in your background the hygiene factor of technical accessibility, pedagogical and informational accessibility. So at this point, um, I'm going to give you something to do. I want to look at this. This is apologies to, well, not apologies to, it's congratulations to the CloudWorks site, part of the University of Leicester's seven C's of learning design. They had this great um, activity there about how to ruin an online course. So we thought it would be a bit of fun looking at the things we've considered so far 
and getting your head in the, the space of, okay, I want to do this well, I don't want to do it badly. How might doing it badly look so that you can then say how doing it well would look? So again, on your, um, on your copy of the learning resource, and perhaps we could pop that in the text chat again. Um, <clears throat> if you could pop the, the link back in the text chat in case anybody's joined late and not seen it. Thanks, Ron. On your copy, um, on page 12 of the resource, we'd like you to um, vote for which of those do you think are the key ones that, that are most likely to cause an issue. So you can just click on the, uh, the, the votey button on the right. You can add arguments if you want to. We're going to give you, we're being really generous for this bit. This is not Patrick Moore speed. So we're going to give you uh, another four minutes or so. So take your time, look through those. And then if you've got any comment, you know, you, that's what I'd like you to focus on. But if there are any comments or questions, pop them in the text chat and we will uh, just have a look and make sure we've not missed out on anything important. So Ron's just refreshed on the main screen for us. So let's just have a look at this. There's some quite clear things coming out at the minute. And again, you know, just because you voted in a way that's completely different to other people, you know, that's neither here nor there. It's reflecting your own context, your own experiences, etc. But what's interesting is that we've had um, Lack of confidence and enthusiasm from the teacher, very high on the list, um, followed by overloaded course content, encouraging surface learning, um, no interaction between tutors and students. These, you know, immediately, I'm, I'm <laughs> that's ringing bells with me. It's kind of thing, yes, uh, how many times have you seen courses? I've looked at probably two, three dozen um, courses uh, on, you know, as part of the accessibility snapshot work that JISC does. And so often I'm seeing things that are really overloaded with loads and loads and loads of content on it and no interaction, None, you know, just students, you know, download this, read it, write an assignment, download, read, write an assignment. Um, so, uh, could, um, the comment, adding the arguments is really valuable too. So if you have a chance, um, we're, we're nearly done on this, uh, on this section. We've got another, another two minutes at the most and then I'll pass over to Lillian. But uh, again, this is the real value in these future teacher webinars is not just what we tell you, it's what you tell us and it's what you, experiences you bring to it for one another. So if you get a chance in the next minute, do add um, any additional arguments in there? Some of your reasoning for that? It's worth saying, Alistair, that if anyone does add a new idea, then the the numbers of votes for it will be different because obviously it hasn't been there for people to vote on. Yes, if you add a completely new idea, that's true. And it won't necessarily mean that nobody's valuing it. It just means that it wasn't on the list. But you can equally, you can add the arguments. So uh, like the lack of confidence or enthusiasm of the teacher. Um, 
this comes across in, in you know, for example, live lessons and can affect student engagement. That's a really important point. In a weird sort of way, the, the points being made here are a really nice exercise to run with any tutors who are about to embark on designing yeah. things like an online course, because once they can laugh at the, themselves, if you like, about ways they, could, they might ruin it, they'll commit to the opposite action. Well, you'd hope so anyway. Exactly. And Lillian, I think that's a very good point. Um, we are actually a minute early for the handover. But oh, great. I just wanted to get that in. I'm a minute early. Bear in mind that your clock's a minute. You're in the south, so time well, works differently for you. That's true. That is true. But mm -hmm. Lillian, I've taken, I've stolen time from you so many times in the past. Have some back. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so it's very interesting. We've ended up with like I think the most popular thing there is uh, no interaction between tutors and students as a a way of ruining an online course. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, we're going to talk very briefly about uh, some some of the concepts, if you like, about designing technology enhanced program, and this will be underpin all that our guest speakers will talk about later. So we've decided to call it the four P's, and the four P's uh, stand for philosophy, psychology, process, and, and production. So under philosophy, um, as you've all kind of um, uh, had more votes for the fact that to ruin a course, you don't design in any interaction between the tutor and the student. Now, that, that's an approach that you're taking. So from the outset, when you're designing your course, you, you should situate yourself in uh, a philosophy, if you like. You know, you might say, right, my students are going to spend a lot of time looking at resources. Remember resource-led learning? Uh, my, my students are going to spend a lot of time looking at resources and learning stuff. I'm going to give them lots of quizzes. They're going to practice this thing until they're very familiar with it. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing for students who are very much novices, very early in their information gathering or acquisition stage. But clearly, you would want to have a range of approaches. And that's where this kind of using the theory, like um, these just e-learning models, <clears throat> Uh, which is kind of a, a, an overarching way of all the different e-learning models tend to sit themselves in one of these uh, core uh, philosophies, if you like. But what I found was that you can use a bit of everything and design a much better course. You know, you make sure you look after your novices, making things more associationist. You make sure you think about how they're going to activate learning when they're looking at things, when they're communicating with their peers, when you're giving them feedback. And you think about how you can situate that learning further by asking the learners to do more reflection, uh, support each other, and, and try and practice what they've learned in the real communities of practice. So that, that's that for um, the philosophy. Sorry, if you just go back um, one slide, Ron. The, the other thing I thought I'd try and do is, 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 is kind of use that food analogy that we've been using. In a sense, thinking about the philosophies like trying to decide whether you're having Indian Chinese roast dinner or a barbecue, okay? So you make that decision before you go and buy your food, which is the next bit. So the next bit, psychology, we're looking at brain-based learning. Okay, so the brain-based learning is the bit where you're kind of thinking about how are you going to activate um, that desire for students to learn um, so that they become uh, excited about the learning, they're motivated, they're reflective, they realize that they're learning. So these are some uh, brain-based learning approaches that we covered in our very first webinar, 14 webinars ago. You can download this uh, infographic that we created. And if you want to find out more about each item, the next page on this resource explains it a little bit more. You can go and look at each and every item and it, it tells you what, what each item is. So in a sense, again, the food analogy, this is kind of, like I said, the motivation for a learner to kind of be in that learning environment with you. So maybe you've designed it as a three course meal, a buffet, you know, the size of your plate, all these things are taken into account in the way you design your, your learning. Okay, moving on. Um, the third P 
PE is the process. Um, so you are planning your technology enhanced program. You will, you've decided on your philosophy. You've thought about how you're going to motivate learners, etc. And now you're going to kind of start creating this coursework. There, there are loads and loads of structures out there that can guide your process and your production process. So ADDI is one of the most famous uh, ones. It's, it's kind of an instructional design process or model. And there are loads of others that we've linked to from our mind map. Um, so feel free to go and explore those. Um, and as well on the on the third column if you like we we're going to introduce uh, further on um, and our speakers will talk about the JISC learning design family tree now a lot of these if you kind of follow one of the processes like you know the abc curriculum design process it kind of challenges your thinking about your philosophy as well as providing the space for you to design your activities for your learners so it kind of is a two-in-one process so if you like, your, your process um, is like your food preparation, isn't it? You're, you're, you're planning when you're going to do your food shopping, where, what you're going to buy, how you're going to prepare it, how you're going to time your cooking so that the roast dinner comes out at a particular time. This is your process and this is when you think about how you're going to create this e-learning for your students. Um, and then we have production. Okay, so production, food analogy again, this is your choppers, blenders, woks and knives, okay? So these are the kind of tools that you might use when you're actually creating a piece of online content or a quiz or you're sending learners to Tricida or Cloudworks to interact with each other. So we've got a very limited set on our mind map and I think you can scroll up, Ron, so that you can see it's not just creation tools, but also con uh, social construction tools, you know, where the learners might interact with each other. What we'd like you to do in the text chat is to uh, mention anything that's not covered here. You know, maybe you use a particular tool. I know some people talk about Sway. I've not used it myself. Uh, maybe, I don't think Camtasia is in there, but stuff like that. Anything that you think might be missing um, from our tools or our social um, constructivist tool set, you know, do add it to the text chat and we'll, we'll see what people come up with. Pebble Pat, ePortfolios, yeah. Colin uses Sway, forms, blogs, can you allow the coming thick and fast, thing link, VB project, yeah, that's brilliant, yeah. Trello, that's interesting. Okay. Oh, yes, video scribe. Excellent. Excellent. No, this is very useful. Some things that we, yeah, definitely, some things that we don't uh, have in our tool set, you'll have in your tool set. And, you know, we, we're, all, <coughs> we're all confident with a particular tool set, aren't we? Quite stand, yeah, okay. Zappa AR, okay, that's quite advanced, Colin, using augmented reality. Cool. So some of these clearly are synchronous tools and some are asynchronous tools and some require the teacher presence and others are very much student led um, tools as well. So thanks. We'll mine some of these, I think, and add them to the to the mind map after this. Uh, Damien, what's OBS? <laughs> I almost read to find out. <clears throat> OK. Yes, <clears throat> Ron Mix mentioned that. In our next webinar, we'll be focusing a lot more on the actual production of e-learning. So if you're very much more focused on the actual creation of these uh, assets, then please do join us for our next webinar because that will be the one for you. Okay, so what we're going to do is move on to the guidance um, that we've talked about so far, the four Ps, if you like, and how this has been applied by people who have been creating courses uh, or who are currently creating courses. So this is where we introduce the JISC e-learning family or learning design family tree. <clears throat> so some of these models that were covered in here, you've got the links in your resource. Um, don't, don't click on it now, but what 
what we're going to do is introduce some speakers who will tell you about how they've applied some of these um, some of this thinking into the courses that they've designed. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Helen, who is our first speaker. Uh, and we have to make sure that she has her microphone turned on. Hello. Hi, Helen. Away you go. Thank you very much. Great. Um, moving on to uh, so with, with the uh, food analogy, I guess I'm talking about some recipes. And you, there are all sorts of recipes, and they're slightly different, or they're a lot different. But these are a recipe for course design workshops. I'm just going to talk about two of them um, this time. So the first one is Carpe Diem, and this was developed by Julie Salmon and colleagues. Uh, I was part of the team at Leicester, but she developed them further in Australia, and then other people have developed it on. Um, it's very intensive uh, approach, it's team-based, and it's very practical. You start with a vision and you end up with um, activities uh, that are learner-ready. Um, you, you think about threshold concepts, that's something I've just started with on, on a staff development course I'm working on. Um, you start with the end in mind, which is the outcome, not the assessment, but you keep assessment in mind. You think of the blend right from the start. And then there's um, a model to scaffold learning and a model to structure learning activities. So an example of scaffold learning is um, the next one which is um, Jilly's five-stage model, which you've probably come across, which is a way to start at the bottom to build a learning community and develop learners who are able to take their learning outside the course and apply it. Next. Uh, so this is the uh, design process for Carpe Diem, and I've, I've mapped the ADDI principles in it. We haven't really said those, have we? Aims, design, development, implementation and evaluation are the principles of ADI. Um, and this, this maps fairly well onto Carpe Diem. Just go back, back to it uh, just, to, just to say what, what, they, what those steps were. So you'd start by designing the blueprint. So you think about the vision, what you want to do. In 10 years time, somebody comes up to you in a lift and says, oh, I remember your unit on whatever because it changed my life in this way. What do you want them to have said? Um, you then make a storyboard. Most of these design principles have a storyboard in their approach. Um, in Carpe Diem, you then start building your prototype um, and you actually create activities. Then you check reality not fully implementation, but you get somebody in who doesn't know anything to test them out for you, then you review and adjust and take them out. So you get quite a long way, next one, um, but it is quite a long time. It's two days, 12 hours over two days, but it can cut to the, to the quick. It can replace the toing and froing and the emails and the meetings and so on, which could otherwise take months. Really important to get the whole team together to crack the process um, from beginning to end in as short a time as possible. Next. So this is an example that I started doing um, of a storyboard and it's very basic. There's a lot of post-it notes around in, in, in planning. I'm sure you've done it yourself. Okay, next. Another example here, this was um, developing a um, dementia awareness course. So it can be quite messy, but then it develops into real activities. Carry on. So in the activities, there's another recipe here, um, which I think these have been around a long time, the activities, but it's not about, here's a forum, discuss. It's about giving them a way to post, you know, um, do this, go on to the next one possibly a bit better so in the post you've done a waste audit post three things then how to respond or whatever uh, this is very classic forums but you can do them in in wikis and i'm just looking at how to develop this in teams um, and other apps like that okay move on so in carpe diem it, i've used it for all sorts of subjects and levels automotive repair in um fe uh, often it, it's it's quite um, 
a team building exercise and it's quite emotional for some teams to realize that they're together um, we've used it all the way up to to masters education and so on pre-meeting then the carpe diem then some kind of follow-up with training in tackle it from the program level if at all possible this is a, an overview kind of thing include everyone if you can librarians learning technologists the best ones i've been in have included students as well you have to work at the facilitation and be familiar with it carve as much time as possible i've done it in half a day but you're not going to get all the way through two days of it um, start the storyboard just before lunch so people start looking at it and then they look at it over lunch to get a bit of extra extra time okay move on so these are some resources for carpe diem which will be available to you and then next a uh, bit about the abc ld workshop was developed by clive and natasha at ucl um, this is again is a team intensive approach but it's only 90 minutes and it's very much the storyboard section so it's based on pre-printed cards which we have next and it's adaptable to a number of other um, technologies um, at all institutions so go through the next one and then the next one that's an example and the next one resources and the next one just comparison so you need to know them but they both have great resources so if you haven't heard of them have a look try them see what you think okay <laughs> Adam. okay so um that's great helen um we're, we're going to kind of move on to the next um, speaker and I think people feel free to kind of keep asking questions in the group chat um, hello can everyone hear me okay Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Hello, uh, hello. I'm Julia Brennan um, from the University of Surrey, and I'm going to talk to you about um, how we've approached designing a degree apprenticeship program here. So um, this year we're going to launch two degree apprenticeship programs, um, offering management professionals the opportunity for career development through a degree qualification, leading to an industry recognised apprenticeship award. So this is quite a new approach um, to um, teaching and learning for us, um, um, which gives a, a whole new set of challenges for programme teams because our traditional um, higher education curriculum, um, for good, for better or for worse, tends often to be knowledge-based, teacher-centred and designed for post-A-level students um, studying full-time on the campus. Whereas um, it's quite a shift moving towards degree apprenticeships, which need a curriculum that's competence based, um, aligned with an apprenticeship award. Um, so that means a defined set of knowledge, skills and behaviours. There's a whole set of terminology um, that you need to use in this area. Um, it needs to be apprentice centred and drawing on professional experience. Um, and weighted towards, and our particular offering is going to be um, primarily online, um, and, um, and obviously it needs to fit the work-life patterns of apprentices. So um, to meet this challenge, um, Darren and I, um, in, our, in the Department of Technology and Hearts Learning here, um, have devised a series of workshops to help the teams with this um, design challenge. Um, we used a backward design approach um, to facilitate um, a constructively aligned, apprentice-centred, activity-based curriculum. And we too, like Helen, used um, the ABC method to sort of do the storyboarding side of things and look at the blended delivery and the supporting technologies. So we'll, um, Darren's going to now explain this in more detail. And then um, after that, I'll give reflections on how things have gone and how we can improve things. So, if you could move us on to the next slide, please. Yeah, thanks very much, Julia. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Darren from the Department of Technology and Enhanced Learning. So what we've got here is a slide showing the backward design overview map to the uh, workshops that uh, myself and Julia designed for this uh, to help uh, academics through this design process. Uh, the backward design, we've kind of touched on it already with the carpe diem because it's, it's, it's this idea of, the, uh, of having the end in mind to, to begin with. So, 
backward design is so called because it essentially reverses the traditional model, model of curriculum design that defines the subject matter of a content of a program first. And then what happens then is that you decide the learning outcomes and how they'll be assessed. The uh, problem with that is it can lead to a very sort of content heavy curriculum that students struggle to engage with and apply within practice. And again, that's, that came up with the, on, on the polling earlier. There was, there was quite, quite a big issue with too much content, particularly when it's online as well and there's a very little interaction. So the idea of backward design is that it kind of reverses things around. Whereas, so in this case, the decision as to what content included actually comes last rather than first. So what determines the content is, uh, first of all, you decide what the students want to learn. So the desired results or outcomes, that's stage one of backward design. Secondly, how you will evidence student learning. So that's the uh, forms of acceptance uh, of, um, uh, of assessment. So that's your second stage, determine acceptable evidence. Uh, and then finally, what students will do to achieve the, those outcomes. So the planned learning experiences that you plan to, to help students achieve those uh, desired outcomes and, uh, and obviously evidence that they've done that on, on, on the actual way. So only then do you actually decide what content is needed to support the activities and that those can be things underpinning concepts, principles, theories, uh, those kind of things, which are then presented via a range of face-to-face -face or online resources. So doing that help, obviously helps with the idea of constructive alignment. So you're starting with a bigger picture and drilling down to the detail rather than the other way around. And it ensures relevance of the subject knowledge to practice. It's just not a lot of knowledge which has just been just been given out without context, which is then, then you basically assess them. So in a nutshell, backward design is kind of activity led rather than content led, uh, which is more suited to the needs of an apprenticeship program, certainly for what we're trying to achieve. So just to try to put that into context, if imagine a management professional on our degree pro, uh, apprenticeship, studying, for example, market, marketing analysis, rather than a series of lectures covering fundamentals of market analysis followed by an essay, to assess their knowledge and understanding, which it's what it might typically be on a, on, a, on, a, on a degree course, they would actually do a market analysis, we'd actually ask them to do a market analysis about their own organization because they are effectively working professionals while they're studying. They can then produce a report demonstrating uh, these management competencies with reference to marketing principles. So essentially they're applying theory to, uh, to their practice. One thing to note, uh, if you look at um, the first section, identify design results. Um, first thing we've got is what do you want students to learn? There's, a, there's an element which we've added here, which is who are the students? Uh, that's really important because that's, it, it's key to, for any design work, as it helps you uh, and certainly the academics in this sense uh, focus on the design on the user, because it's, it's very easy to be, end up just designing in isolation from your end users and you end up, um, designing for yourself and in fact and that's uh, that, that's and then, and then it becomes very teacher centered rather than student centered so end of the workshop then so academics have uh, hopefully they've, they've gone away with some activity outlines mapped to the big challenges of the industry all nicely constructively aligned then the next stage is to break those down into a sequence of learning events uh, using the uh, the abc cards uh, which essentially become the best of the year curriculum so if you want to go on to the next slide uh, we've gone through this already, but uh, essentially the learning type cards are based on Dinah Laureate's conversational model of learning. And they're quite useful in ensuring activities make use of a range of, of learning types. So if you like, sort of ways of engaging uh, with, a, with a subject matter, but also with self, peers and teachers. So, it's, it's, so you're actually ensuring that you're building interaction in as well. So you've got acquisition type, collaboration, discussion, investigation, practice and, uh, and production. So if we, if we go back to our market analysis activity, it could be, for example, broken down into uh, investigations. So the, apprentice, the apprentices are looking into their own organization with, with, with a reference to, uh, uh, to a market analysis. Uh, we might then add some acquisitions so they understand some of the theoretical principles that we want them to apply. We might then put it in practice to apply their market analysis. They then discuss it as a, in the form of a peer review. So each, each apprentice shares their, uh, uh, their market analysis for discussion. And then the final stage, which is usually production, because with any activity, it's important that there's some, uh, there's some output which can be used as evidence for learning or otherwise. It could be in this case, case a reflective report evidencing learning and development or competencies. So once you've got a sequence uh, that's, that's sort of sorted out, we then turn over the cards. So if you go on to the next slide, 
and this is just one example. So on the, on the back of the cards, uh, you've got a list of kind of tools, face-to-face uh, -face and online, which you can use to, um, uh, in terms of creating resources, output formats, and so on and so forth. Um, and, then once, and then you basically write all that up and that becomes your, your, your storyboard and your, your sequence of your curriculum. So in a sense, we're, we're actually applying the cards in a backward design way as well, because um, the original intention was to use them to build blended learning activities from the ground up. But what we're doing is, is we're taking an activity outline already produced from the first workshop and using these cards to break it down into a kind of a blended learning sequence. So it's, it's so they can be very useful, but we're using them slightly different to what was intended. So well, that's the theory behind the process. Um, I'll, I'll pass you back to Julian. I was going to talk a bit about how things have worked out in practice due to, uh, to date and some of the lessons we've learned. Uh, so yeah, next slide, please. Oh, you're there already. Okay, over to Julia. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so what we found was the module leaders were really engaged with the workshops. We had lots of positive feedback and great energy in the room and some good emergent designs. Um, the persona activity, um, who was the student, was a great place to start because it helped the leaders understand the unique needs of the degree apprenticeship students and it sort of set the tone for the rest of the workshop and we used them to create some design principles for activities. But on reflection, um, we really, it's a bit of a change management sort of a thing really. We needed to think about where those module leaders were in their journey from face to face to online teaching. So when we adapt the workshops, which we do need to do, we'll need to do more work on helping the module leaders understand what teaching online really means, helping them visualize what their course will look like at the end of the process and how they will deliver it by giving them exemplars and case studies. We also need to work on looking at how module leaders will adapt their existing content to activity based material while giving it an overall course structure so that they feel they're not starting from scratch and we're building on their existing knowledge. Um, in addition, we also feel that we need to tie in the design with the production. Um, it was interesting seeing that ADDI model because actually that's kind of what we're doing without realising it. Um, but, um, so we need to sort of encourage those module leaders to leave the workshop with some design work completed. Um, this is something I'm particularly interested in because I'm the production lead um, for the online courses and responsible for ensuring the courses are made on time and in to quality. So um, to add to these initial workshops and address this issue, we've created a planning template and additional activity writing workshops to help module leaders um, complete these. And um, these planning templates are now the first milestone in our production process. And those templates, they just really, it's like um, an overall map for each week, looking at learning outcomes, activities, content, the role of the tutor and um, assessment. So um, yeah, we've got some work to do, but um, it's, it's all very interesting because we've sort of started off more as a consultative um, approach, but now we're taking more of an active role to help people deliver the courses. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Julian, thank you. <clears throat> Hello, are you gonna work the slides for me then if I give you a cue? Okay, so um, yeah, thanks for inviting us to um, contribute to this session. I think these webinars have been absolutely fabulous. So congratulations to you guys for putting them all together. Um, you asked me to give some thoughts about learning design. Um, so I've put a few slides together and there are some notes at the end <clears throat> based on my experiences. So I've been involved in the Zerti project for a long time. And a lot of my attention has been on the development of resources um, of this ilk for um, you know, multimedia resources for learners to use as uh, enhancements to their learning. So um, that's my context. And it strikes me looking at all of this, that people's experiences of learning design are very different depending on, oh, I'm not ready for you yet, De depending on the, sort of the context they're working in. So how you approach learning design is going to be very diff different whether you are building a Xerti learning object or whether you're a teacher planning an hour long lesson or whether you're um, <clears throat> designing a, pro a whole program, a degree program. So it's a completely different context and completely different approaches. So thinking about what is learning design, learning design is um, a design that describes the educational process and it makes explicit the pedagogical functions that the parts of the, or the sequence, <coughs> parts of the sequence play. Um, and it describes how and why learning takes place. So it's written in a vocabulary that educators understand. 
And it's not necessarily about technology and it is not in itself a pedagogy, but it makes the pedagogy explicit. Um, so the process of learning design is the activity of designing units of learning and learning activities or a learning environment um, and being clear about why and how they support the learning that you want to take place. Now, learning design can be supported by tools. There are tools that help people step through a learning design process. Uh, LAMS is, is an example. Um, and I think the problem with it is not necessarily that easy to use. Um, and I think that may have stopped people engaging with it. But ABC is also a learning design process, and that's very easy to use. We've used it here at the University of Nottingham, and I've seen people take very readily to that. So it's nice to follow up from the previous session. Learning design allows designs to be shared and reused, and it allows designs to be reviewed and tested. And it is a 21st century approach. So in my experience, when I first started getting involved in the design of multimedia learning, um, I wanted to know how to do it well. And I started reading a lot about instructional design. Um, and what I discovered with that is it's, a, it's not necessarily a 21st century approach. So next slide then, please, Alistair. So instructional design, what is instructional design? Instructional design obviously is concerned with instruction. Um, and first and foremost, it's about how to sequence <coughs> activities for learning to take place. But the priority it takes is on the instruction rather than the learning. And before the Second World War, there wasn't very much of this stuff around at all. And the Second World War necessitated the training of large numbers of people in the use of equipment and so on. And that needed to be done efficiently. And so people started to look at how would we do this um, and make it effective and efficient based on a lot of behaviorist ideas, which dominated most learning design in the 20th century. And it led to things like SCORM. Um, instructional design is based on a needs analysis and the subsequent systematic design of the instruction. So it is a systematic process. It, had, it has no emphasis on social learning and it doesn't accommodate any constructivism. And you could interpret it as being more about training than about education. Um, but nevertheless, when I, I see a lot of instructional materials that people have put together or educational materials, and the problem that I come across too often is that there's very little evidence of sound instructional design. <clears throat> I was gonna step through a few of the instructional design theories that, that I've sort of been, been familiar with and have used in my own work. So if you wanna skip over out of there. So when I first started reading about this, the, one, of the, one of the people you'll come across immediately is Robert Gagne, and he came up with something that he called the Nine Events of Instruction. This is in 1956, and it struck me that 1956 was quite a long time ago. So if you were teaching people to do a parachute jump, Gagne's nine events are that you should gain the learner's attention. So you might say, you're going to do a parachute jump. If you get it wrong, you're going to die. So now you've got people's attention. You inform the learners of the objectives so that they know what the materials are going to do for them and how long they're, how long they're going to spend using it and that sort of thing at the beginning. Um, and then they activate prior learning. So the, the, the prerequisite knowledge that might be required to deal with this material, you need to get people to think about. But then you present the content and provide guidance. So um, in our parachute example, then you would show how a parachute works, you would explain what will happen and what people need to do, demonstrate the process, and then get the learner to perform and elicit some performance from them. So you practice it, and then you give them some feedback. So if they're not operating the parachute properly, then you need to tell them what they're doing wrong, and then assess and test that they can do it, and then they can go and do it for real. So the, the, the steps are gain attention in form of the objectives, stimulate recall, present the content, provide guidance, solicit performance, provide feedback, assess performance, and enhance retention and knowledge transfer. Now, some people would say that that's old fashioned, <clears throat> um, but it's better than nothing. And I, and I think it's, it does put together a reasonable sequence for how you might think about putting together multimedia. Next one, then, Alistair. Now, Bloom's taxonomy is the test of time. Now, that's not about putting together a sequence, but it's about how to understand um, the, the types of learning that you want to create. So at the bottom of the pyramid are the sort of lower level facts and concepts that we need people to know. So in our parachute example, um, you need if the, the bottom knowledge, the facts would be how to pull the drawstring. Above that, you have comprehension. So you need to know how the parachute works, what a parachute is, um, and how it functions. And then above that, application. 
So <clears throat> how to apply the knowledge of that. Um, above that analysis, <clears throat> above that synthesis, above that evaluation, and then I add another one above that, which is innovation. And in our parachute example, at the bottom you may have something like, you know, what the parts of the parachute are and how to operate it. At the top, in terms of innovation, it may be that you're designing a whole new way of <coughs> um, controlling flight for, for humans with a, with a wing suit or something like that. Okay, next one. So the ARCS model, <coughs> this is again, it's quite a simple thing and it's thinking about and giving a priority to motivating the learner and understanding that that is a key part of the successful learning. Now I find this sort of motivational post is extremely demotivational, but people do put them up to my considerable amazement. And the ARCS model was from Keller. This is a bit more recent in 1979, still a long time ago, but he said that you need to get the learner's attention you need to make the material relevant. You need to give confidence and satisfaction. So they were the, they were the things that he thought led to effective learning. <clears throat> okay, next one, Alistair. So in the 90s, when all of the multimedia learning stuff started to come around, people started to follow the ADDIE process for building that sort of stuff, and they ran into a number of problems with it. I think ADDIE is good for large, complex program design <clears throat> but i don't think it works well for multimedia development i don't think it's good for small discrete units of instruction that you're putting together and in my experience it's not how things work in the real world and because you have no opportunity to iterate and before it just takes too long before you start finding things out that you should have found out earlier so in my own experience is i found it effective to put a working prototype in front of the people that i'm working with um, as soon as possible and it can be really basic but it should allow them to get from the beginning to the end and experience the the learning design that i'm working on and to start to um, contribute their thoughts and feelings about what works and what doesn't so that we can then iterate and and um, create something much more effective so i think i've certainly found rapid prototyping to be effective and that's my sort of natural um, leaning to do something like that okay next one i like the idea of pedagogical patterns <clears throat> there was a project over the last about 10 years ago that was sort of involved in a little bit <clears throat> trying to identify a whole number of different pedagogical patterns. Pedagogical patterns come from the idea of design patterns in computer science and the idea that we have re reusable solutions that we that have been well developed and that we can that we can use again. Um, it's a little bit like learning design in that you're you're setting out a sequence of activities or a sequence in the presentation of multimedia or, or whatever and um, that you know works well. Um, <clears throat> you can capture and share them um, and you can describe how you think the learning <clears throat> is, is taking place um, and then other people can take and reuse those and it means that people that don't necessarily have the pedagogical insights or the specialist knowledge in this sort of learning theory can go ahead and create something that ought to be effective and I think my, one of my biggest um, observations in the 15 years I've worked at the university is that there is not enough conversation amongst people that are putting together learning resources about pedagogy. It's something that is left to the School of Education to worry about and too many people don't do that and we come across too many resources that don't display that much evidence of any pedagogical thinking at all. So the idea that specialists can share this stuff and, and then allow people that don't either have or want to have that insight um, <clears throat> I think is a good one and Julian, Julian can I just can I ask for a one minute wind up yeah I'm just doing that now brilliant and, and then just to just to finish off 30 is a great tool for capturing and sharing pedagogical patterns and learning designs and it allows you to create templates that you can share amongst your community and I'm done that's great. And the notes are there as well. Thank you very much, Julian. Sorry to hurry you because I know right. everybody's, you know, it's kind of crept forward. Um, Lillian, do you want to take over? Thank you yeah, very just much. very quickly you. so that we can catch up on time. Yes, thank you very much to all our speakers. Very, very thought provoking. And I'm so glad we've captured everything. So we didn't have time for Vicky, but I've done an interview. I look very sad there, but, but Vicky looks very excited. So that's fine. Um, and you can find out more about the enhanced program that she talks about. These are 
short um, training resources that you can access. Um, they are targeted at further education, but, but the concepts will work for anybody if you've got HE academics who are thinking about flipped learning for the very first time, by all means, send them here, you know, a quick five minute introduction to the to the concept is available. And um, so moving on past that. Um, we we actually uh, have an example by Alistair. We, we, we put a call out um, on Twitter for people to fill in a padlet about the kind of examples of course designs. So Alistair's created his on, on, on this page for you to look at. Um, and uh, Alistair, I'm not sure if there was any audio or if it's kind of self-explanatory. Um, oh, look at it at your own time. It's self-explanatory, yeah. but it's an example of minimum skill, minimum tool, maximum pedagogy. So it really ties into some of those key points that Julian was making about that focus on pedagogy. Yeah, and you know, um, earlier, <clears throat> earlier, lots of people that said it's 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 a big down vote for uh, courses that are very text heavy. That, I don't think that's true. I think I think text heavy with a purpose, with good writing, can just can be just as motivating. If you think back to courses like Letol, mm -hmm. where we had very low graphics, but a lot of good pedagogy, it worked really well for those of us who took it. That, that's true, but don't assume that mine is text heavy until you have a look at it. No, I'm just looking <laughs> at your current Zerthy object and it just happens to be, but yes, I shall not make any judgments on that, Alistair. That's, that's, um, just, that's telling you what I did. That's my <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, we, we've had lovely contributions on our Padlet and I do encourage you to kind of continue um, adding to it after this webinar. If you think about the fact that you've already designed a blended program and you've considered the, the, the things that all our speakers have mentioned and the frameworks and models that you actually used, you could kind of pop in here and do a piece of reflection about how you designed your um, blended learning program or your online program. It'd be really, really nice to see a few more examples and see how they relate to the theories and frameworks as well. Thank you. Um, and then the next slide, I'm sorry I'm going so fast, but this was uh, another opportunity for us to crowdsource um, it's kind of staff development courses and resources because on registration a lot of people had said we want to know how to encourage our colleagues to start that process of learning to be uh, better uh, at creating resources or monitoring online activities or being an online tutor. So we thought it'd be quite timely to pull together all the kinds of resources available. Um, and it could be that someone's already done it before. So one of you might pop in like a killer app, like a one ring to, to rule them all. That would be brilliant. At the moment, we're, we're thinking of all the ones that we know, um, and we'd be grateful if you could pop them in. Now, obviously, we have quite a lot of good resources ourselves from all our webinars and all our Xerti learning objects. Um, so if we, uh, we, we've added our link on here. And Ron, if you can scroll down to the spreadsheet links just to show people that when you filled in the form, you can go and look at. Uh, so we're hoping this would become like a database of um, all the possible kind of, if you like, courses, your, your MOOCs, anything that introduces staff to online tutoring or online um, course creation. Okay, so we'll tweet this and we'll add this to the JISC mail as well. Um, and then we are over to you, I think, Ron, if that's right, on to, on to introducing our digital competency framework. Okay. So, yeah. So, we, we've, we've talked in the past about the framework that we work to. This is the EU digital competency framework. Um, what's nice about this is that all of it is focused on the actual aspects of teaching and learning, taking into account your professional development, taking into account the learner's competencies as well. So, this is quite a nice framework to, to, to use. Uh, it's got nice <laughs> levels that it encourages you to think about. Um, so, do visit this and have a think about how maybe introducing your tutors uh, to staff development by thinking about where they are relative to this um, might be a good way to get them to engage in the journey. Um, so over to you, Ron. Uh, thanks, Erin. Um, so even even less time to uh, 
to go through these last few slides, except we do have a final activity for everybody. Um, step one of that is to do join a reminder to do join our mailing list if you haven't already, and you'll find the details on this page in the resource that you've already got a link to. Um, our next webinar is very much focused on the creation of online learning activities and resources. So following on from program design and perhaps more specifically on learning design, but obviously mindful of everything we talked about today. Um, and we have one final activity for you, and that is to share in the text chat what one thing will you do as a result of uh, what we've discussed today. Um, and while you're thinking about that and responding in the text chat, uh, a reminder on the last page that we use Xerti, it's been mentioned a few times and Julian obviously mentioned it. And we make no apologies for using this because it's a great tool for collaborative authoring and uh, suits many different learning designs and we'll talk much more about that in the next webinar as well. So final activity before you all leave and we'll also um, have an informal discussion is to share what one thing you'll do as a result and, and any final thoughts you might have uh, to share with everybody and a big thank you to all of our guest speakers um, and we look forward to further communication via the text chat and via twitter and via the mailing list Alastair, Lillian, any, any final thoughts to add? Yeah, um, we've had someone volunteer to um, help uh, put their insights into developing actual e-learning content for the next webinar. So if anyone else on here has a good experience that they'd like to share, uh, we might kind of interview you and, and put, turn you into a resource for the next webinar, or we might actually invite you to kind of um, uh, speak to the audience um, live. So just, just to mention that. Including sharing actual <coughs> examples of learning content yeah, and activities. I think, I think everyone's very keen on that. I think um, some sometimes people are constrained by what they can share, but if if you're talking in general terms and you can strip out specifics on some of your learning designs, that might be relevant. I, I might do some of that with mine as well. That'd be good. Can I ask Ron? Uh, Corey is saying there, I wish I could use Zerti with Canvas. Um, no reason I, why not. You're just embedding. You're embedding the Xerti object yeah, into Canvas. Absolutely. Um, Xerti will work with just about any learning management system and VLE. And if you, if you're struggling with that for any reason, perhaps we don't have time now. But post on the Xerti forums, and we'll we'll answer your questions. I'm I'm sure Xerti is compatible with uh, Canvas. Yeah, I mean Canvas is just. Uh, uh, it's like a, it's just a VLE basically, and it's got pages where you can actually embed things. So, you know, we've embedded things like Padlet, so there's no reason why you can't embed a Xerti learning object. Yeah. Um, Corey, if you want us to, you know, if you want to send a request to, I don't know how to get, do we, we, we have access to the email addresses anyway, don't we, Ron? Corey, if I have your permission, I'll, I'll, I'll test it out and, connect with you afterwards. Okay, thanks. <laughs> that saves me a job. <laughs> I was trying to do the whole GDPR thing. And, and just as a point on that, um, I was in a webinar yesterday about the, the kind of new iteration of um, LTI, which is the specification that the VLEs use, and the newer version of that, which is uh, I think called LTI Advantage, will, will certainly work with Canvas and and um, Blackboard and the main players in the LMS VLE market and, and Xerti will eventually work with that as well. So some really exciting possibilities with all of that. And for those that know Xerti, it's already has XAPI compatibility and um, very strong and powerful learning design benefits from that, which we'll talk about next time. Mm. So I think just to say that normally we'd have stopped recording, but Usually we just carry on chit-chatting. So um, I, I guess we'd like to say that the, the webinar's officially finished, but I'm, I'm reading people's group chat. Alistair and Ron and I will probably stay around for a couple more minutes and just have a chat with people. So feel free to go or feel free to stay. And thanks very much everybody for contributing. Um, it's been wonderful to interact with you.
And thank you particularly to our three presenters as well for very different but very complementary and helpful mm. insights. It's always great to see actually what somebody is genuinely doing rather than you know talking about the hypothetical things that people might be doing. And, yeah. and if our guest speakers are still here and want to <coughs> say any final comments by opening their mics, please do. It was Caroline's first uh, session and she survived very well, I think. Well done. Well done, yeah. We ought to have a prize for, for that. <laughs> Oh yeah, Rianne, we, we do have a, a webinar on how to run webinars. Um, I'm not sure if this is in time for you. This is a webinar myself in May. When are we running our how to I run webinar? Our next one is, isn't it? No, is it's, it's April. Oh, right, April. Uh, oh, right. So yeah, Rianne, it might be in time for your May one. So that'll be good. Um, absolutely. Oh, Helen, that's good to know your first session. Thanks for coming and uh, bring a friend for the next one. <laughs> yeah, Rian, yeah, brilliant timing, absolutely. Now, the one thing that I would encourage uh, everybody to do when they go away from here, have a look through the resource again. And remember, those interactivities are still live. So if you, know, if you wanted to use any of uh, those 30 resources, you know, you've got the link to it now, that will continue to be live for I think two years at least. Mm. Um, so do go back, work with training teams, you know, sit and do the Padlet exercise together, have a look at the resources mm. on the Google form, have a look at the, um, the Mentimeter, etc. So you know, use them, they're designed to be live, they're designed to live beyond this session and that's mm. why you've got access to them. It's important to say, repeat there, Alistair, you were referring to the, the interactive parts of those things our commitment is that all of the resources we've made available will be available for at least five years beyond yeah. the end of the project so mm. um, plenty of time to consume them but um, mm. <laughs> whether our learning designs and pedagogies are still valid valid at that time is another mm. matter and um, also the tools that people recommend i mean i i was pulling out stuff from alt c 2013 and thinking U USB resources what what is that or voice recorders that are you know mm. all these little tools that we used to have now it's all been superseded by your smartphone it does everything and in five years time it'll all be VR and wearable technology so things can change a lot in five years I'm gonna stop the recording there just in case we stop too negative